What follows is a conversation Kevin Halloran had with Bill Mills, the founder of Word Partners, on the book he co-authored with Craig Perro called Finishing Well in Life and Ministry, God's Protection from Burnout. We hope you enjoy. Bill, let me kick this conversation off by asking, what is the story behind this book? Well, I did struggle with burnout, uh, Kevin, and um, it, it was an experience with the staff and leadership of uh, our ministry. Uh, a battle of expectations and hopes and dreams and opportunities. And uh, <clears throat> I did not know how close I was to giving up and losing heart. I didn't know how close I was to my own strength ebbing. And um, I, I, I experienced a time of, um, of losing heart and quitting. Uh, so I, I've experience the battle that I'm writing about and um, but also what what was behind this is knowing that it, it's hard for us to keep up with modern statistics that keep coming out but it seems like probably about half the people serving in ministry are burned out on some level in the ministry physically emotionally spiritually where they're battling with the strength to keep going yeah, let me read a couple of the quotes from this book. It says, 50% of ministry leaders are so discouraged that they would leave the ministry if they could, but they have no other way of making a living. Another quote or, or stat is that 1,500 pastors leave the ministry each month due to moral failure, spiritual burnout, or contention in their churches. So this is a a widespread problem that really everyone in ministry will face it one time or another, or will be uh, the possibility of facing. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to read a quote from you, Bill, and have you unpack it a little bit. It's from page 17 of the book. It says, The terrible disease of burnout is not primarily the result of our unfortunate circumstances. It is not a function of our lack of resources or planning, nor the result of our own failings and weaknesses. Burnout is largely a spiritual problem rooted in our theology, for the battles rage primarily in our hearts and minds. What does it mean that burnout is primarily a spiritual problem? How do you understand that? Uh, first of all, Kevin, I, I don't think there's uh, any relationship between hard work and burning out in the ministry. Uh, sometimes uh, that's the encouragement we give to each other. You know, you've just been working too many hours, uh, taking on so many responsibilities, you need to back off and rest. Um, there, there are surely are times when that is wise counsel and a great need. But uh, we look at the ministry model of the Lord Jesus and the Apostle Paul, and uh, they were working very hard in the ministry. And... Uh, I believe that burnout is in the sense of a theological problem. It's, it's a combination of an inadequate view of God and too big a view of ourselves in the ministry. Uh, and the pressure building up that uh, it all depends on us to work hard enough, be well enough organized, an attractive enough personality, a good enough preacher uh, to build a church. And when we understand that uh, this is about me and what I'm doing, it depends on me, we're setting ourselves up for failure and burnout. When we understand that God is at work, he's fulfilling his purposes, and he's given us the resources of Christ, the indwelling Holy Spirit, and he is sufficient for all that he gives us to do, the more we're able to rest in the battles. In a lot of conversations about burnout, people will mention the need for the right balance in the Christian life between ministry and rest. Uh, what is your thought on that? Well, the truth is we, we do need to provide times for rest. Uh, the Bible is so wonderful in teaching us about Sabbath, regular patterns of rest from work. Those are gifts from God. And uh, so we need to take days off, we need to take holidays, we need to take alone time to think, we need time with our wife and our children uh, to just enjoy creation, to get away from our work, uh, to rest. But at the same time, we're in situations where often we can't rest. 
We've got uh, Bible study preparation. We have sermon preparation. We have administrative responsibilities. We have people who need to be visited. Others need to be discipled. Uh, the needs and opportunities around us are relentless. And um, often uh, we think what we need to do is somehow keep all of the responsibilities that we have in life in balance, and that's the answer. But I don't think that's a biblical answer. I think the model of the scriptures is not a balanced life, but a poured out life. And uh, uh, what we need is the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Uh, how do I take care of myself? How do I be the husband that I need to be? How do I be the father that I need to be? How do I be the shepherd that I need to be? We need the wisdom of the Lord to know where to put the emphasis at the right time, drawing on the strength and resources of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're not smart enough to figure out the proper balance between work and ministry and our needs for ourselves. The Holy Spirit will show us what to do. But I believe we can go into the ministry wholeheartedly with the knowledge that we're going to lay down our life but uh, we need to do that with the wisdom of the Spirit and the direction uh, that he brings from day to day um, and uh, walk with him in that process. Bill, one thing I really appreciate about this book is that you know, the focus is not merely on the, the practical do's and don'ts of avoiding burnout, although you know, those, those are in there and they're extremely helpful, but the focus is really on uh, underlying issues, spiritual issues in the lives of God's servants. And the book really focuses on several different people in Scripture. Elijah, Moses, David, Peter, Paul, Christ, a few more. And really shows what they and their stories lend to the burnout conversation. What can we learn from the story of Elijah about burnout? Yeah, Elijah uh, was in a horrible battle, wasn't he? As the story is given to us uh, in the Bible. And he had incredible enemies. And uh, he was dealing with a people who were in idolatry, had given their hearts away. And uh, he was tasked by God to call these people back to himself. And um, talk about a ministry that is so big that it's impossible to fulfill. The only way it can be done is through a big God. And when we read the story of Elijah, we see ourselves in it because he experienced the battle of burnout on a, in a very vivid way and a way that we can relate to. We can see it step by step. Uh, you know, the, the big responsibility of the idols of Baal and the people had given themselves and Isaiah with the sacrifice and... Uh, uh, God answering by fire. I mean, it was such an emotional high. And the Baal, who cannot produce life, uh, he's dead in every way. And uh, God used Elijah to bring a great victory and great revival to God's people. And yet, he's emotionally exhausted at the end of it, which we can relate to when we have very big and high times in ministry. We see God work in powerful ways. Often, uh, pastors will know how they feel on Monday mornings sometimes. Often, after the great victories and the battles that are won, we feel very empty and somewhat discouraged. And uh, so, after this confrontation with the powers uh, of Baal and the great victory, uh, Jezebel, the king's wife, has her eyes set on Elijah. She's going to kill him. And when he was able to stand before the powers of Baal and his priests and win the great victory, he runs away from Jezebel. And uh, he sees himself out of proportion. And uh, he says to God, I only am left. And sometimes we relate to that feeling so alone in the ministry. All the needs, the responsibilities, the battles to be fought, the victories to be won. I only am left. It's all up to me. And God reminds Elijah, no, I've got... Uh, uh, several that I've kept from myself. I've held a remnant. You're not alone, Elijah. But, you know, he runs away, and um, the beautiful thing about the story is as he runs, God is running after him, and when he gets there, God meets him where he is. 
And uh, God does give Elijah rest and food and water. He gives him a co-worker. And when we are facing the battle with burnout, we cannot diminish uh, the reality of those needs. Uh, it, it's largely a spiritual battle. And uh, uh, it hinges on our view of ourselves in relationship to God. But we do need rest and proper diet and holidays and that, those and coworkers. Those mm -hmm. are real helps. But when the story turns is when God comes to Elijah with that quiet whisper calling Elijah to stand in his presence. And it's a reminder to us that in the physical needs that we have and the reality that we we do need rest and proper diet and exercise and co-workers. The bigger need is to be able to hear God's voice when he whispers and to come and stand in his presence and becomes one of the part of one of the most beautiful themes in our Bibles. From Moses, when God says, I will be with you, to Elijah when he says, come and stand in my presence. It's the reminder that God's presence changes everything. And that's where we find our hope. So unless God is our resource, no matter whatever else we do, nothing is going to work in the end that will protect us long term from losing heart and burning out. Um, and another example from this book and from scripture that I think really speaks powerfully to those in ministry is that of Habakkuk. And he has some just incredible lessons to teach us about expectations in ministry. Can you share a little from the story of Habakkuk? Yeah, I, I think that uh, this is one of the most wonderful and vivid examples in the scriptures of how God protects us and keeps us, Kevin. Um, if, if ministry flows out of our visions and our dreams, then, uh, then our prayers will center around God coming and entering into our dreams and bless them and making our plans happen of uh, enabling us to build a great ministry that we can dedicate to him. And often God works outside of our visions, our expectations, and our hopes and dreams. And this, this happened to Habakkuk, and he is um, in a terrible battle as the book begins because he's crying out to God. What The things that are going on in his nation, he talks about lawlessness and iniquity and injustice violence. And he says, God, you're not doing anything about it. And uh, as the book unfolds, God comes and says, actually, I am doing something about it, Habakkuk, uh, <laughs> something bigger than you can see. I'm actually going to use your great enemies, the Babylonians, to bring you into captivity. And uh, I am going to deal with the injustice and the sin among my people, the violence. Uh, <clears throat> and Habakkuk is terribly confused. What are you doing, God? <laughs> These people are more evil than we are. How can you use them to bring judgment on us? And so there's this great collision between the prophet's expectations, hopes, and dreams, and plans. Great collision with God's purposes. And um, by the end of the book, uh, the prophet Habakkuk is dancing on the high places. And um, how does God get him there is the big question of the storyline of the book. But if, if we are shepherding our people who are facing confusion and broken dreams and expectations that are not being fulfilled and the pressures of daily life, how do we carry our people from the beginning of the book where the prophet is confused and in despair until the end of the book, where people are able to, even when nothing changes in their circumstances, how can we enable them to dance on the high places with the Lord? It reminds me of a conversation I've had recently with a pastor I know who uh, was part of a team of three on the pastoral staff, and one Sunday, both of the other staff members resigned uh, in front mm -hmm. of the whole church. And just imagining the devastation this pastor mu must have felt when publicly he felt abandoned and must be wondering, oh, is the church going to hold together? But this pastor, although in anguish, 
uh, shared with me just his confidence in the Lord that the Lord is sovereign over this. Mm. The Lord knows what's happening and the promises of the gospel are still true even in the midst of this crisis in this church and that you know, even though he's incredibly sad, everything that happened, he can dance in the high places too. He can rejoice when cupboards are bare, like it says at the end of Habakkuk, yes, when yes, yes. you know the wallet, his wallet mm-hmm. is empty, or the church's wallet is empty. You know, the Lord is still the Lord. The Lord's yes. not going to abandon His people. A big part of the story, Kevin, though, is how God ministers to the heart of the prophet as the story unfolds in the book. You know, the big picture is, yes, I am doing something. I'm going to bring the Babylonians. They will invade you. They'll bring you into captivity. But there's reminders for Habakkuk and for us. Uh, The just shall live by faith. You need to keep trusting your God and his purposes. The enemies are coming, but the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This great power will not in any way distract from the fulfillment of your God's purposes. And the amazing picture in the beginning of the book, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians are marching through the earth. I mean, this great world power, evil, evil people heartless people. They're marching through the earth. But then toward the end of the book, there's this beautiful picture of Habakkuk's God marching through the earth. And his focus begins to turn. And you mentioned God's sovereignty a minute ago, Kevin, and this hope and confidence that our God is on his throne. He will fulfill his purposes. I think sometimes we forget that the most wonderful fruit of knowing God's sovereignty is he's creating a place in the hearts of his people where they can rest and worship even when they don't understand or don't have the power to face their enemies. They can rest in him. They can worship. They can dance on the high places when the cupboards are bare. Mm -hmm. And so often we take things like God's sovereignty and we turn these great truths that are aimed at our hearts. We just let them be mind games that we toy with and lose the gift of rest and worship in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for your time. I want to encourage listeners to pick up the book Finishing Well in Life and Ministry by Bill Mills and Craig Perrow. That's available on Amazon and also our web store at store.leadershipresources.org. Bill, why don't you close in prayer, asking the Lord uh, for those who are listening, just for the grace to finish well and to draw near to him. Thank you, Kevin. Father, as uh, we have struggled with this terrible battle of losing heart along the way, uh, there might be several listening us to us this morning who are in that same kind of battle. The enemies around us are so strong and our own resources are so weak. So often we can't think of the right things to do fast enough, can't come up with the answers. We lose perspective in the midst of the battle. And Lord, sometimes when we think of the hopes that we've had, how you would use us in ministry to lead your people in worship, to develop young people who love you and serve you, to build a church that will glorify your name. Lord, uh, sometimes the fruit does not match the dreams with which we've come. And sometimes we just want to give up. Lord, would you turn our eyes to you and would you make yourself more and more bigger, more beautiful in our eyes, stronger, Remind us that we are part of a great process. We are laying down our lives, but you will be our keeper. You will provide everything we need along the way. Father, to those listening today who are discouraged, would you fill them with encouragement and hope? Would you strengthen them in your great power, your your goodness, your beauty, your sovereignty over every purpose of your heart and give us rest. In Jesus' name. This audio recording is a production of Word Partners, a ministry dedicated to elevating God's life-giving word in the hearts, lives, and ministries of pastors and their people.
Learn more about our ministry at wordpartners.org.